that their ancestors are Hindus. Recent studies on the DNA show that all Indians, whether they are Hindus, Muslims or Christians, have the same DNA. And all Maharashtrians and UP also have the same DNA. Which means Mr. Raj Thakre and the UP taxi wala have the same DNA. <laughs> so in view of this new research, this whole English theory of Aryans and Tibetans has been demolished. So much so that even the BBC has disowned the theory as a incorrect racial theory. We are Indians as one and we were at one stage 100% Hindu and uh, due to unfortunate circumstances it got truncated but then still we have remained a predominantly Hindu country and the culture of India is a Hindu culture and in that context economics has been a part. Unlike West where economics is separated uh, from everything else. In India, the Hindus have always considered economics as a part of the overall uh, human development. That is why a thinker like Dindya Lopadhyay, who was president of the Jansan before he was killed, he had coined the word integral humanism. And that integral humanism included his theory of uh, of economics, which uh, part of it is reproduced in the souvenir put out to you. Recently, there has also been a spate of books in the West, and I've quoted one of that in my uh, in the uh, in the article reproduced in the uh, souvenir uh, by Bruce Rich, where he talks about the ethical values to be derived from 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 our tradition for globalization. There's another recent book uh, which has come out, uh, not recent, very recent, about two years old, Samuel Stewart Jacks, where he talks about sustainable accountability in economics based on Vedic values. So now we are finding many, many, uh, many books coming out from the West uh, in this. And uh, there has also been a recent acknowledgement that this pure materialistic development, one-dimensional materialistic development of society does not lead to happiness. And that is why you find a lot of people now taking to Hindu practices. The Business Week, uh, which is a, a well-known, now it's called, I think, Bloomberg Business Week, had an article about three years ago saying that one of the concerns of corporates in America is that their executives die early due to heart attack. And heart attack was traced to stress at workplace. So finally they have begun in new terminology uh, giving uh, courses to executives on what is essentially Bhagavad Gita where it is pointed out by Lord Krishna that you are master of your own actions, but the results are not in your hands. There will be a, there will be a reward for your good actions, there will be a punishment for your bad actions, but how and where and how to be faced will be decided by me. This is what Lord Krishna says, if I may paraphrase that in loose language. In other words, sometimes you may work very hard and get nothing. And sometimes you may work nothing and get uh, uh, lots. Or you may, you may have a good job and a bad wife, or a bad wife, a good <laughs> wife and a bad job. <laughs> that is, this balance is always achieved in our tradition. So this kind of, of course I'm not making gender Comments. I can say you can have a bad husband and a good job and vice versa also. Uh, therefore, there was something unique about Hinduism which enables stress to be dissipated. And stress comes when you get this ego that I worked so hard or am I so incompetent that I couldn't produce the result. 
when you develop the psychology that I have only freedom for action and I must do the right thing, what result comes? Well, I am working for that result, but if it comes or not, I am not going to be unduly depressed or disheartened. Then you are a good Hindu and that means you won't have stress. And that is why there is being taught to corporates. People have taken to yoga, people have taken to so many other things. Recently a very famous actress from Hollywood uh, who has won Oscars called Julia Roberts came for shooting to Haryana and she, what she, she, she found she, she told her people that they, she wanted to meet a Swamiji and uh, they took her to an ashram and in the ashram she said to the sadhu that I have got billions of dollars but I am not happy how do I become happy so he, he then told her he, she will have to stay 10 days, which he did, where he taught her pranayam, taught her Gita, he taught her um, uh, other things. And then she was so improved, she felt. When she went back to Hollywood, she arranged a press conference, called her husband and two children to be present, and declared that she was a Hindu from that day. <laughs> because she said, it's the only religion for me, how to be happy. So that is the key point about Hindu economics. Economics is the science of optimal allocation of scarce resources to get the highest or the optimum rewards. And that's not so simple as it looks. Sometimes you can have a factory which pumps fumes into the atmosphere. You may make a lot of profit, but the society will be losing because those fumes would cause cancer in the resident population. So these in economics we call as external economies or diseconomies. And therefore you have to take a holistic view. And the only, only culture which has always been holistic is this culture of Hinduism. And today we talk about corruption. Why is it that the corruption has, was not there when Hindu society was at this peak when you had 35% of the world's GDP. All the visitors who came from abroad, the one thing they mentioned about India, take Farsi and from, we are today speaking, I'm today speaking in China, what is officially China. Farsi came, how many, 1700 years ago, and he, he spoke glowingly about the economy of India, but he said the honesty of these people, that surprises me. He says when they leave the house in the night to go for some function, they don't lock their house in India. He said if you lose, if you leave something behind in somebody's house, they will chase you and re return it. This is attested by 700 years later when Yuan Chong came, by Vasco da Gama, by Mark Twain, so many of these people who came till about 600, 600 years ago we had people writing about the honesty of the and that is because our society was not structured on the basis of how much money you make. In fact, uh, when I became a, when I went to Harvard first time to get my PhD, my classmate asked me, "How can you accept Mahatma Gandhi as your leader?" So I said, "Why? What? No, why not?" He said, "Because he's not properly dressed." He said, "Leader must be properly dressed." And if you see the Western countries, all leaders have the best suits and the best tie and shining shoes. But you see Mahatma Gandhi or Jay Prakash Narayan, many of these uh, leaders, they wear such simple clothes. In other societies, it will not be accepted. Similarly, the Pope is so well dressed, he's got satin gown, diamond necklace, ruby necklace, sapphire necklace, his, 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 uh, his cap is full of jewels. But you see our sadhus, the biggest sadhu, the most famous sadhu for where foreigners are flocking today, you find them very simply dressed. Because we didn't disapprove of pursuit of wealth, but we never thought that should be the deciding factor in social structuring. The social structuring went to those who are knowledgeable, who made sacrifice, who personally didn't have any wealth or weapons or, or land. And it was not based on birth. Unfortunately, our one national dharma is got ossified because it is got connected to birth. Otherwise, it has nothing to do with birth. If it had to do with birth, 
then Vishwamitra wouldn't have been the Rishi of Rishis. His parents were Kshatriyas. Or Valmiki, whose parents were Dalits, he would not have written the Mahavar, the Ramayana. Or for that matter, Veda Vyasa, whose mother was a fisherwoman. So, this division of labor, and then ranking it on the basis of knowledge and sacrifice. Knowledge was given the highest importance. And today, we recognize in economics that the most important thing is not capital, it's not labor, but it is innovation. Innovation means knowledge. And today, India is poised for that focus again, because we have the youngest population of the large populations of the world. The average age of an Indian is 28. The average age of, a, of an American is 38. Average age of the Chinese is 37. Average age of the European is 47. And the average age of the Japanese is 49. Is this young population which should be the focus of Hindu economics? Hindu economics doesn't mean that we are changing economics. No, economics laws are the same. If demand rises, prices are going to rise. If supply increases, prices are going to come down. Other things remain the same. Those laws will not change. But what will change is that we will have different objectives. The uh, capitalist wants to maximize profit. We will not think of that. We'll think of maximum social gain as an objective. The communists want to maximum production. We don't want that. We maximum production at the cost of environment. The Hindus will never agree. So we will have clear objectives, priorities, a strategy, and resource mobilization methods. That is the that is economics. It will change. Japanese did their economic miracle by a different way. What did they do? They took the same Motorola uh, transistor uh, radio and uh, you know cut the overhead costs by reproducing little, little parts of it in different places and then assembling it together. That was the Japanese miracle. There was no great innovation or anything like that. They just took the American centralized production system and decentralized it. What is the Chinese miracle? They take semi-processed semi goods of the East, East Asians and then they add value to it and put uh, made in China and then sell it in the West. They have a deficit in trade with East Asia but a surplus, huge surplus in trade with the West and therefore their, their model is export-led. But they are not producers. This is wrong. The indigenous character of Indian economy is far greater than the indigenous character of the Chinese economy. Almost uh, the, uh, of the exports, almost 65% is produced in foreign funded or foreign owned companies in China. So there, this is a new model. For us now, we have to think in terms of growing but at the same time to ensure that the society is structured in a way that what it is our strength is not destroyed. And that means to ensure with this new electronics and internet and so on to see how the family as a whole participates in economic development. So what would I suggest then? First of all, <clears throat> I would suggest that our society should be structured in such a way that uh, we place knowledge as the key factor in keeping with the Hindu principles and that means development education. I would urge all Hindu minded entrepreneurs who have made money, please invest in India. Don't take money from the government, then you don't have to give reservations. Reservations is only for uh, those who, uh, uh, where this, the institution takes money from the government. If you can set up private universities, world class, attract talent, pay good salaries, you will have, you will get repaid in several, uh, several times. So the, the, the one of the commitments of the Hindu for developing the Hindu uh, <coughs> economics is to have a university where you can play with the syllabus also, although there is a syllabus committee of the UGC and so on, but you can at the same time play with the syllabus to sense, to develop a new mindset. We need our people to think uh, differently from what the British historians have produced for us in terms of history books. 
People ask us, young students ask me, we were so great those days, why did we lose? We lost because we were too civilized. That's why we lost. Now what do you mean by that? We had rules of warfare which was totally unsuited for those who came from abroad. For rules of warfare between our own Rajas. We had basic rules. First is, no war will start before sunrise. No war will continue after sunset. So, after morning after having your bath and uh, going to the bathroom and all that, then you go to fight. And in the night you come back to the tabu and go to sleep. No war will take place in the agricultural field or in the population center, but in open maidan. That's how it happened with, in the Mahabharata. That's how when Ravan got to fight Ram, he had to come out to the open battlefield. And after losing, if you apologize, then give up, give everything and send him off with full respect. And so Prithviraj Chavan forgave uh, Muhammad Gauri how many times? I don't know. <laughs> Seventeen times. <laughs> Forgiving him more than once is wrong. <laughs> and to, to forgive today's terrorist even once is wrong. So that was our cultural. <laughs> so when Gauri came, he came at 3 a.m. finally, when he learned his lesson. And he came at 3 a.m. He first attacked the population centers. So by the time Shivaji devised new methods of warfare, we had already become very much weakened. Guru Gobind Singh in Punjab and Shivaji, they adopted new methods, but it was too, it was, by then India was a very depleted country. So today we have to learn new rules that exist. And we have to understand what our strengths and weaknesses. <coughs> We say we must inv invite foreign direct investment openly. Well, Walmart, there's a big campaign going on in Walmart. Why should Walmart come to India? They are going to come with capital which they are getting at 2% to 4%. And the Indian industrialist who has to, or the Indian trader who has to compete with him, gets his capital from banks at 12% to 18%. So there's a complete lack of level playing field there. And then Walmart will participate in buying the same labor pool as the Indian traders will be. So naturally this is an unfair competition unless the Americans agree that India can take its labor to America when it wants to build a house or build a road and so on. There the Americans say no, 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 immigration problem. We cannot have it. Even for software engineers they are making such a big love. So there, sometimes people tell me, see, China has Walmart. But China, under communism, destroyed the trading community completely. They killed them all, calling them petty, petty bourgeois. So when they have to bring, when they want to have a trading expansion, naturally they have to get foreign investment. But India doesn't need Walmart. India may need other things. And they should be based on reciprocity. So. Uh, I would say, I still have what, another five minutes, I think. <laughs> Ten minutes, okay. So I would say, first of all, education should be given. A, a good Hindu entrepreneur is one who will focus his attention on additional activity if necessary on developing education. Because that's where the future lies. If tomorrow India were to perfect hydrogen fuel cells for automobiles and then sell it to the rest of the world and we are as close to it as the Americans. The Americans can't do it because their oil, oil companies will never allow it. They say all our investments will go to the dogs. We can't allow this. Petrol can be replaced by a new technology called the hydrogen fuel cells. India has done also considerable research on it. And if we, for instance, as Hindu entrepreneurs, who want to liberate this country from the stranglehold of Arab oil, this is the way to do it. You get those innovations, you work on those innovations, which will liberate you. And if you do it, then it will be only a matter of time before the Arabs return to their tents and camels. That will be the situation. <laughs> because what else do they have except digging up a hole in the ground and getting oil? You don't see any industry right from Right from Tunisia to Indonesia, you will not see much industry. So 
this is one innovation is the driver of economic growth and that means education and that means Hindu because we have always elevated that to the highest status. The second thing is we must recognize that the cheapest agriculture in the world is India. And that's the family system is based on that. The uh, rice that we sell in India is seven times the price of rice. I mean, you get it, the rice in South Africa at seven times the price. Same thing with Japan. Of course, it's not easy to export rice easily because of the Doha thing you can send to Europe. The milk we produce in India is 50, the European milk is 15 times that. Now they say that the Indian cow, which they call as uh, uh, Bos Indicus or something, about Brahmin herd, popularly called Brahmin herd, that is considered to have the maximum medicinal value. That's 15 times in Europe. And how many cows you've got? You've got 150 million cows. What's the average yield of a cow in India? It is only 200 liters per year. What is the average yield of an Israeli cow? 11,000 liters per year. Imagine if 150 cows started giving 11,000 liters per year, how much milk we will have? Probably we'll have to swim and milk that much milk we will have. The same thing with the yield per acre. Every item in India, the yield per acre is the one of the lowest in the world, yet we are the cheapest agriculture. If agriculture can be globalized, then we, and for that you'll have to fight because the Doha rounds have not been completed. If we can manage, do our politics, the government gets into the action and gets a good settlement on the Doha rounds on agriculture, India can become a globalized agriculture. And if a globalized agriculture, then the farming, farming poverty will go because he'll get seven, eight times the price. And the yield per acre being so low, and the fact that we, even though India is one of the few countries which can do, grow three crops a year, 12 months of the year, you've got sunshine. Therefore, uh, if agriculture gets enough investment, it will become a great boomy thing. Finally, I would say that we have to devise a way in by which we integrate values with with material growth. This, without this, this sacrificing of values that is being taking place is responsible for corruption. Long run corruption can only go when you dethrone the importance of money. Money is necessary, wealth is necessary, but it cannot be dethroned to decide how the society is structured. And this globalization is doing that. You ask any IIM student why he is going to IIM, he says you'll get a good job. He's not going there for marketing. He's not going there for finance or to listen to Professor Vaidyanathan give a lecture. He's not going for that. He is, he is going for this reason. So I would say that um, there are a vast number of opportunities. We can start thinking in concrete terms as to what we can do. We have to integrate three Hindu communities. The Hindu community in, in India, the Hindu community abroad, which itself is part two, two parts, one who came as originally as, as laborers and now have become deputy prime minister and prime minister, uh, and who have stuck to them. They are more Hindus than we are because they under very difficult circumstances have remained Hindus. So they should be called first class Hindus, we should be called second class Hindus. <laughs> So this committee, and finally there is a new Hindu who is spreading Hindu ideas through yoga, through, uh, through meditation, so on. In fact, now we, I find that the uh, NASA has, a, agreed, has decided to teach Sanskrit as compulsory language because the most computer friendly language in the world. They have given up English, they have given up French and so on and for the field of artificial intelligence, they have accepted Sanskrit. Because in India, if you say teach Sanskrit, they will say you are communal. You don't have to worry. Let us be proud as Hindus and realize our past and mold our future according to our principles. Thank you.